Uh, thank you guys for inviting me. This is uh, this is kind of cool uh, to have everybody here and to uh, give a, a talk for to people who have been my mentors for years and my colleagues. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about small bowel bleeding, uh, which is the bane of a lot of gastroenterologists' existence. And if you ask me how I got to be the small bowel bleeding guy at Mount Sinai, it's because no one else wanted to do it. <laughs> and I was the new guy, and they said, all right, Mix, just let Steve take care of it. So, uh, but, you know, it is a, a big problem. As I think we've all shared patients with small bowel bleeding, and it's very frustrating. It's very challenging. So I'll try to um, maybe share some pearls and sort of how we approach it and, and what we do. Um, so... Uh, this is a brief outline. We'll go back through some backgrounds, uh, go through a couple of cases to illustrate uh, some points, and then hopefully draw some uh, meaningful conclusions. I'll try to get through uh, all my slides. I may have too many slides, but we'll try to try to get through it all. So uh, a little bit of background. So terminology. So this is something that we all learned in medical school, but I think it's really changed a lot. Um, so the traditional definitions of GI bleeding uh, were that there's upper GI bleeding, which is anything above the ligament of trites. And then there's lower GI bleeding, which is everything else. And they each come in two flavors, occult and overt. Occult being that you can't see it, overt meaning that you see melon or hematochesia. And then there was this uh, category of obscure GI bleeding, which is when you've done your, there's GI bleeding, you've done your endoscopy, your colonoscopy, and maybe a small bowel series, and you can't find a source. And so the small bowel was this kind of this black box that we just had no access to. Uh, but this uh, traditional definition came uh, came about before I broke the computer. Um, any, uh, any tech savvy people? Oh, here we go. Um, so this definition um, was uh, developed before the advent of all these new technologies that we have for looking at the small bowel, including capsule, uh, device-assisted enteroscopy, um, CT enterography, and uh, angiography. And so with the advent of these new technologies, um, some of this terminology may be, may be changing. And this was proposed in a, um, a, a review article in um, 2015, um, where this black box disappears. And now maybe we can just define things a little bit uh, more concretely as upper GI bleeding, which is anything in the upper GI tract within the reach of an upper endoscope, colonic bleeding within the reach of a colonoscope, and small bowel or mid, mid gut bleeding. And obscure GI bleeding should really be reserved to cases where a source can't be identified despite looking at the entire GI tract with these different modalities. Um, so for this talk, we'll focus on small bowel bleeding. And uh, in terms of epidemiology, so how frequently does this happen? It seems like we see it all the time at Mount Sinai, but it's just because hospitals all over the place kind of funnel all these patients to us. And, uh, but really, it's, it's kind of rare. And uh, EGD and colonoscopy will identify your source of bleeding 90% of the time. So 90% of GI bleeds are either upper, uh, in the upper GI tract, or in the colon. And that leaves about 10% for, for everything else. And in, in those 10%, 75% of the time, you'll find an identifiable small bowel source. Um, and in about 5 to 10% of the ca cases, you won't find um, so small bowel bleeding accounts for about 5 to 10 percent of, uh, of cases of GI bleeds. And so maybe around 5 percent are truly obscure GI bleeds where we've done everything and we just can't find it. Uh, so for those of you who like pictures like me, so the, the big red part is EGD colonoscopy, good. The yellow part is small bowel source and the black is we just don't have no idea. So what causes small bowel bleeding? Um, so when you... Um, when you're thinking about a differential, it really, uh, the demographics of the patient makes a huge difference. So for young patients, uh, the most common things are going to be IBD, uh, dual fall lesions, which are these ectatic arterioles that are submucosal and can bleed like stink, um, cancer, that like just tumors, lymphoma, carcinoids, rarely adenocarcinoma, uh, things like Meckel's diverticula and, and polyposis syndromes. In older people, which is what we mostly see, it's, it's going to be vascular most of the time. So angioctasias and dual fall lesions. You can, of course, also see um, cancer and uh, NSAID ulcers. And then there's this laundry list of really rare things that you only see on GI boards and that I've, I've never, ever, ever seen in, in, in real life. Um, so uh, a few cases to try and illustrate um, some of these things. So, all right, case one. This is a 68-year-old woman. Uh, noted to have microcytic anemia on routine blood work. She denies noting any, frankly, bloody stools or black stools. 
Uh, on exam, she's hemocult positive. Her iron panel is consistent with iron deficiency. She undergoes an EGD and colonoscopy, which are normal, and she's referred for evaluation of anemia. So this is more of an outpatient case. Um, but presumably, we're thinking this patient has an occult GI bleed from a small bowel source, since we did an uh, EGD colonoscopy for normal. She's five positive. So how, how would we approach this patient? So I'm going to base a lot of this on the um, ACG guidelines, which uh, came out in 2015. Now it's about three years old, but it still really lays a nice gr groundwork for how to think about these patients, how to approach the workup. So uh, for this patient, we have suspected small bowel bleeding. And whether it's occult or overt, the next question that we think to ourselves is, well, should we repeat an endoscopy? Well, why would you repeat an endoscopy? So this sec question of second look always comes up. And the reason is that there have been a ton of studies that show that we miss things a lot. Okay, so this is a, a, a bunch of studies that looked at um, small bowel uh, cases where they looked at the small bowel but actually found bleeding in the upper GI tract. So whether they did a capsule study or a push enteroscopy or a balloon enteroscopy, and in a high percentage of cases, up to 26% quarter of cases, they found something in the upper GI tract. So um, in this in probably the highest quality study, they had 143 balloon enteroscopies in half the patients. They found lesions outside the, GI, the uh, small bowel. And in about a quarter of cases, they found a definitive source of bleeding outside the small bowel. So um, repeating an endoscopy is very reasonable in these cases before going to the small bowel. And so the, the things we consider, well, when was the last exam done? Was it done last week or last year? Um, what was the quality of the exam? Was there a poor prep? Was there you know, some other limitation? What were the findings? Is it something that, um, did they have a lesion that may be worth looking at again? And what was the character of the bleeding? Is the patient just having uh, guaiac positive stool or are they actually pouring out melanin? Right? Um, so second look endoscopy is a, a common first step in evaluating the small bowel, even though it's not the small bowel. If you find something, you treat it. Uh, and if you don't, then you move on to your small bowel evaluation. So in small bowel evaluation is, is done either with imaging or with capsule endoscopy. 99% um, of the time, well, I shouldn't say that, most of the time, um, we usually start with a capsule endoscopy to, to evaluate the small bowel. So um, capsule endoscopy, the way it works, anyone who's not familiar, patient comes into the office, they usually um, don't need a prep, they just are on a clear liquid diet the day before, overnight fast. The nurse hooks them up with a utility belt, like Batman, that has a bunch of sensors in it and a, uh, a recorder that looks like an old school Sony Walkman. And um, they then ingest a pill, looks something like that. Uh, the pill travels through their system, takes a bunch of pictures, uh, probably takes like on the order of 10,000 pictures over its lifespan, which is eight to 12 hours. Uh, and then they poop the, the capsule out and the recorder they bring back, we download the pictures. I pick up some popcorn. <laughs> and then I sit there and I, and, I, and I watch the movie. Oh, man, my movie's not working. Quick time not available. Okay. Hey. Are these, are these um, approved by insurance for inpatient? So I'm not sure. So when I was a fellow, we had a lot of pushback from our department about doing them as inpatient because they get, didn't get reimbursed. Now we do them a lot. And I'm not sure if that's because something has changed or because the hospital just eats the cost. I think it's probably the latter. I think the hospital just eats the cost of the capsule. Yeah. Um, all right, sorry, no movies today. Um, so in terms of um, this, now even small bowel, the capsule is a great test. So it's the test of choice for evaluating the small bowel. It allows visualization of the entire small bowel. Um, it's non-invasive and in, Studies have shown that in most cases it alters management, whether you find a lesion that you act on or it's totally normal and you can reassure the patient. Um, in terms of how good it is, uh, most studies looking at capsule uh, report diagnostic yield, meaning if you do 100 capsules, how many of them are going to come back with a positive finding? Yeah. And the reason that they, they report that is because it's really difficult to do high quality studies that report sensitivity and specificity because there's really no great gold standard. So to do a, a comparison study with something like intraoperative enteroscopy or balloon enteroscopy would be really, really difficult. So we just don't have great data for that. So in terms of diagnostic yield, um, there's a wide range in, in the literature from around 40% to 
there have been a couple of uh, quality meta-analyses and systematic reviews of thousands and thousands of capsules that have shown the diagnostic yield to be around 60%. So when I counsel a patient, I say, well, about two out of three times, we're going to find a source of your bleeding on a capsule. Um, but I think this also, um, we need to take this uh, sort of in, in context, and um, this really depends on patient selection. So um, sometimes we, you know, we see a 40-year-old woman with menorrhagia who um, is iron deficient, and their doctor wants to be really diligent and rule out a, a GI source. So in her, the pretest probability of finding a small bowel lesion is very, very low. But if we take one of our patients on the wards, who's a 75-year-old man with AFib on Coumadin with atrial with aortic stenosis, the chances of finding something is much higher. So the pretest probability is much higher. Uh, all right. So I had some um, cool videos, but those this, those aren't working. Or I think they're cool. Um, so here I do have some still images. So this is a, this was a patient who came in with um, melanoma. This is an inpatient. Had a normal EG colonoscopy. We did a capsule study. And this just shows this huge volcano of blood in the jejunum. The patient ended up getting a, an enteroscopy, and uh, we treated a uh, ble bleeding AVM. Um, this is another case. This was a, a um, guy with cirrhosis, multiple medical problems, came in with a similar type of picture. And this is what we found in his capsule, these little red guys. Those are pretty classic pictures of AVMs. That's what they look like. They're um, kind of um, they're bright red. They're kind of like, um, they have these little like uh, spider-like projections that you can kind of appreciate on this picture here. Um, this patient, we actually treated with just supportive care, iron therapy, just because he was so sick, we didn't want to muck around with invasive procedures. Um, this was a young kid in his 20s with Crohn's disease uh, in clinical remission, so he feels fine, but just noted to be iron deficient by his gastroenterologist, sent him for a capsule study, and we found a bunch of these guys. So really deep ulcers, so this is active Crohn's, so patient's um, uh, immune, immune suppression therapy was changed. And uh, here's another woman who was also iron deficient, and she had a capsule study and they found this guy here. So that's a, a polyp, and if you can sort of appreciate this, uh, the head of the polyp, there's this little ulceration. So uh, you can imagine that over time, that can cause uh, some blood loss. All right, so just some... So the, as you can see, the capsule gives us some really, really good quality images of the small bowel. Um, but it's not perfect. Um, so the biggest thing is that we lack therapeutic capability. So we just we see it and, oh, well, there it is. Now, now what? Um, uh, we have difficulty localizing lesions. So the capsule doesn't travel through the small bowel at a constant rate. It flies through some parts, then it slows down, then it flies further. So if we see a lesion, we can't exactly tell where it is. Uh, we try to estimate best we can based on how um, how far into the study it is, but it's very imperfect. Um, it, the capsule really shoots past the upper GI tract, so the, the duodenum is not well evaluated by the by the capsule. So that's why we really rely on endoscopy and push enteroscopy if needed for for the um, really proximal small bowel. And the specificity is not great. So they've done studies where if you, sh you find incidental findings in 14% of healthy people who have a capsule. So not every little, uh, little erosion, little red villus is important. Okay. Um, and of course, the biggest thing we worry about with capsule is retention. So this thing can get stuck. Um, how often does that happen? Um, well, based on a couple of uh, large studies, the um, Capsule retention rate depends on the indication for the capsule. So for bleeding, which is what we're talking about, the retention rate ranges from about uh, one to two percent. Um, for other indications, if a patient has Crohn's disease, they were suspecting a tumor, um, then it could be higher than that. So if retention occurs, then um, you have basically three options. <clears throat> if the patient is not sick, you just wait and see. Just, so maybe they'll pass it in a week, in a month. I've seen people walk around with a capsule for three years, um, there, there is just no, no. It's just, it's just there. Just need, they just need to know that they cannot get an MRI because the thing is ferromagnetic. Um, uh, if um, if the capsule is stuck, I've retrieved a bunch of uh, retained capsules in Crohn's patients with strictures with enteroscopy, and in worst case scenario, they may end up needing surgery to actually take it out. Um, I, it is incredibly rare 
to cause a frank acute small bowel obstruction with a capsule. Because basically what just happens is there's a stricture and it just kind of bounces back and forth against the stricture. It doesn't actually cause, it's very rare that it's going to actually get stuck and cause an acute obstruction. How often do you fail to like uh, capture the capsule at the end of the uh, study? Do they always return it? So they don't have to return the capsule. They oh, flush they it. Just... Yeah, they oh, flush the yeah. capsule. Yeah. <laughs> most, most people, yeah, I don't want it back. <laughs> uh, most people actually don't even see it. And it just passes in the stool. Yeah. So from our standpoint, as long as the capsule reaches the colon uh, during the, the time of recording, we're confident that it's going to pass. The place where we're afraid it's going to get stuck is at a stricture or at the ileocecal valve. So if the capsule does not reach the colon, we tell the patient usually either to check the stool, make sure that it passes, or if they don't see it pass within a couple of weeks, to get it, we just get a flat plate and they'll be able to see if it's still there. Um, all right, so um, you've done your capsule, and let's say it's normal. So the next uh, thing that you would do is a, a CT enterography. <laughs> so um, CT enterography is, um, is a little bit different from your uh, standard CT abdomen and pelvis. They use a very large volume of PO contrast and IV contrast to really opacify the small bowel mucosa. Uh, it allows really great resolution. Uh, it's very sensitive for small bowel mass lesions. And it may allow, actually let you see blood in the small bowel as well. Um, in terms of um, comparing it to other modalities, so um, it's been compared to both capsule and balloon enteroscopy, and it really underperforms for both. So capsule has a higher diagnostic yield, and balloon enteroscopy has a higher diagnostic yield of CT enterography. But there have been a number of studies that, as I just mentioned, show that CT is much better than capsule finding masses. And just to sort of illustrate that, this is a small retrospective study, 17 patients with known small bowel tumors. They had both had capsule and CT, and the CT detected the tumor in 16 out of 17 patients, the capsule only in 6 out of 17. So um, if you're worried about a mass, then cross-sectional imaging is probably a better study for you. Uh, and so that's what the, the guidelines basically suggest, that uh, a CT should be performed in patients with a suspected small bowel, uh, small bowel bleeding, a negative capsule because of the higher sensitivity for mural-based small bowel masses. All right, so now you've done your capsule, you've done your CT. If you find a positive finding, you do something about it, whether with enteroscopy, surgery, medical therapy, what have you. Negative, then that's when we start scratching our heads and we, we, don't, we don't know what to do. And basically, the, that really depends on what's going on with the patient. So if the patient is asymptomatic, their uh, iron levels come back up with, let's say, some ferrous sulfate, then uh, observation and iron supplementation is a very reasonable strategy. Uh, a lot of this is just ruling out really bad stuff. So we rule out a cancer, we rule out a huge ulcer, we rule out actively active bleeding. You support them with medical therapy, and a lot of these people do just fine. If, um, on the other hand, if there is uh, um, another an ongoing problem, they keep bleeding or what have you, you may want to repeat some of the studies you've already done or per, per, uh, proceed to enteroscopy or surgery. All right, so that was case one. Um, questions or comments so far? Okay. Um, so case two. So this is probably more familiar to, to most of us. So 84-year-old man, end stage renal disease on dialysis, coronary disease requiring stents. Uh, he comes to the emergency department with weakness and dark stool for a week. Uh, he's on aspirin and Plavix. His vital signs are 100 over 60. His pulse is 80. He has melanin on rectal exam, and his hemoglobin is 8.5. <coughs> the patient is stabilized and taken to endoscopy. Uh, his EGD reveals some gastric erosions. Cheap stuff. Wouldn't explain this, probably. Uh, no clear source of bleeding, and his colonoscopy is normal. Over the next 24 hours, the patient remains hemodynamically stable, but his blood counts continue to drift down slowly. So this patient probably has, uh, or we suspect has, overt subacute small bowel bleeding. So he's oozing from somewhere. So um, how would we approach this case? So in the, in the case of subacute ongoing small bowel bleeding. First step, of course, to stabilize the patient. The next step is actually, according to the ACG, is still to either do a B capsule or a CT enterography. So the same two studies that we, that we had um, talked about before. So how good is capsule in um, acute bleeding in our, our hospitalized patients? So it's, it's pretty good. Um, 
there have been a bunch of studies that show that uh, timing is everything, as in everything in life, right? So the sooner you do the capsule, the more likely you are to find the bleeding. As in, you can see that the diagnostic yield in a lot of these studies kind of goes down as you go from emergent capsule to urgent capsule to elective capsule. Um, there's this one outlier study that just has really low numbers that I can't really explain. Maybe they just have really bad capsule endoscopists. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, specifically inpatients, um, this has also been looked at and um, in these studies where people do capsules within 48 hours of a bleed, the diagnostic yield for finding either blood, it suggests that there's something there, or an actual lesion to explain the bleeding is, is pretty high. And it leads to reasonable therapeutic yields. So if you find a lesion, you can then move on to either endoscopy or surgery to, to take care of it. Um, after you do these studies, the next step, if positive, of course, you move on to enteroscopy. And if that's, if that's positive, then you treat accordingly. Um, so that brings us to device-assisted enteroscopy, which I spent a lot of time doing. Um, Device-assisted enteroscopy comes in multiple flavors. So there's double balloon enteroscopy, single balloon enteroscopy, spiral enteroscopy. Um, just to sort of illustrate what the double, this whole double balloon thing is, um, basically you have an endoscope. A long scope, oops, and uh, it has a plastic overtube. There's a balloon at the end of the scope and a balloon at the end of the uh, overtube. And there's a machine that inflates and deflates the balloon serially. So this is sort of how it works. So here we go. You reintroduce the scope, overtube comes over, kind of like the Seldinger technique. Then advance the scope even further, blow up the balloon, advance the overtube, blow up the balloon, deflate the balloon. Advance again, deflate the overtube balloon. Oh, advance again. Now you blow up both. So now you presumably have a, a grip on the mucosa with your balloons, and then you pull back and reduce the whole thing to sort of shorten the small bowel. Then you deflate your scope balloon and advance the scope further. And then kind of lather, rinse, repeat, right? And that way you kind of shorten the small bowel and get uh, further in. And you can get pretty far down uh, with this technique. Um, single balloon enteroscopy sort of works the same way, except there's no balloon on the, on the scope. Um, the, you basically use kind of like a torquing technique to kind of hook the mucosal folds with the balloon. There's a, I also had a video of this, but I don't know if that's going to, I'm not going to play. Okay. Same idea. So how good is this? Uh, so, if you look at the literature, the enteroscopy, the full enteroscopy uh, rate uh, is probably, is really all over the place, 16 to 86 percent. So, some studies show that in just 16 percent of cases, you'll be able to see the entire small bowel. Other people, perhaps better endoscopists, 86 percent of the time, they can visualize the whole small bowel. Um, diagnostic yield uh, ranges from 50 to 80 percent, with the pool uh, um, range being about 55 percent. And successful intervention can be performed 40 to 70 percent of the time. Uh, complications do occur. Uh, for diagnostic enteroscopy, the complication rate is about 1 percent. Uh, if you do a therapy, it could be as high as 3, or, three to 4 percent. Uh, and the mortality is, is low. Um, in terms of comparing um, capsule to enteroscopy uh, for diagnostic yields, there have been uh, three large studies, and essentially, if you look at the diagnostic yields, they're almost identical for um, diagnostic yield between capsule and enteroscopy. Uh, but if we look a little bit closer at the latest study um, that had a diagnostic yield of 62 and 56 percent, respectively, if they sort of um, sorted out the patients based on you know, whether they first had a positive or a negative capsule, they found that the diagnostic yield of enteroscopy uh, he really goes up dramatically. So a patient that had a positive capsule and then went on to have an enteroscopy, there was a 75% yield for a lesion that could be treated. Whereas if somebody had a negative capsule, you, you might still find something on an enteroscopy about a quarter of the time, but obviously much less common. So um, based on this, most of the time we'll do the capsule first, both because it's non-invasive and because it may then guide our approach through enter to, with enteroscopy or may not, uh, sort of uh, el eliminate the need for enteroscopy altogether. So in terms of um, how effective enteroscopy is in treating acute bleeding, so this was a, a recent retrospective study um, where 120 people 
uh, underwent urgent uh, enteroscopy, which was defined as less than 72 hours uh, of the last bleed or non-urgent enteroscopy. And again, timing is everything. Uh, the diagnostic yield for an urgent procedure is significantly higher. Endoscopic therapeutic yield is significantly higher. And overall therapeutic yield is significantly higher. The difference between endoscopic and overall yield is, well, if we can't fix it with enteroscopy, sometimes we'll send them to IR, surgery, what have you. Um, and rebleeding rates were much lower if you do the procedure sooner. So um, if at all possible, try to get these people in as soon as we can. Um, but this is the slide that really pains me. Long-term impact, um, the rebleeding rates are really high. So small bowel bleeding, as we were saying initially, is very frustrating, very tough to treat. Um, up to half the time, these people are going to rebleed within a short period of time. Uh, because most of the time, as you guys know, these are vascular patients. They're on a million blood thinners, so something's going to give eventually. So what we like to do is maybe buy the person some time between hospitalizations with treating them uh, by eliminating maybe the most uh, high-yield sources of bleeding. All right, so our patient has uh, undergone their enteroscopy. Um, however, if this is all negative, then our other options include um, red blood cell scans, uh, angiography, or intraoperative endoscopy if needed. Um, and uh, so before that, we'll move on to case number three. So this is a case of a 75-year-old woman with coronary disease, AFib. She presents with presyncope and hematochesia. Uh, her medications include aspirin and warfarin. Um, she, blood pressure is 80 over 50. She's tachycardic. Abdomen is benign, and she has maroon stool in the rectal vault on rectal exam. Uh, she's very anemic. Her INR is 3.1. Uh, she's stabilized, receives a rapid bowel prep, undergoes EGD and colonoscopy, revealing maroon stool and red blood throughout the colon and ilium, but no source is identified. The patient continues to pass red blood and requires three units over the next 24 hours. So this patient uh, has an overt, brisk, small bowel bleed. So in terms of approaching this, so um, first step is always to uh, stabilize the patient, and the next step is usually to do either a, uh, a red cell scan or a CT angiography. And I think most of us probably do a CT angio as sort of the local practice. Um, and if the angio is positive, then the patient can go on to angiography with IR and potentially have a, an embolization. Uh, however, if the patient is unstable, they may go, might go to angiography uh, directly. There actually a guy yesterday that came, last night came in with massive hematochesia who um, got a, had a C, positive CTA, and then IR and myself were fighting about, they, they, they wanted me to scope him, and I was like, no, you just got to get a positive CT angio. How often does this happen? Just to embolize him. They finally ended up coming in, and they embolized. They found an active bleeder, uh, so I think, and I think he's doing well today. Um, so CTA is actually a fantastic study. Um, it, the sensitivity for detected active bleeding is 79 to 94 percent, and in the meta-analysis, the sensitivity was about 89 percent. Uh, the specificity is also pretty darn good, around 85 percent in a meta-analysis. And a negative CT angio is actually very reassuring. It really implies that there's a cessation of bleeding or very, very slow bleeding. So the ne a negative predictive value of a CTA is about 88 percent. So if you have a patient who would suspect of bleeding and they have a negative angiogram, a CT angiogram, Perhaps watchful waiting is not unreasonable. Uh, and the incidence of a positive angiography after a negative CTA is very low. So if you have a negative CTA, you may uh, save the patient in angiography, which is more invasive, higher dilode, uh, more risk involved. Um, tagged RBC scans, we don't really do much. Uh, they have some, some role. That basically what you do is uh, there's a radio-labeled um, colloid particles that, are, that tag the erythrocytes. Uh, then you can obtain dynamic images um, that can detect GI bleeding, can sometimes help localize the bleeding. However, a precise um, localization can be really challenging because of peristalsis, superimposed small bowel loops. So if you have extravasation of the right upper quadrant, you don't know what that means. Is that small bowel? Is that stomach? Is that colon? Is, you know. So um, it does have a role, but it's, uh, we don't use it all that much. Again, the advantages um, really allows dynamic images. Uh, requires a low threshold for bleeding, and a negative study is actually a good uh, prognostic indicator. And I think we've had a couple of cases where we tried to get a, uh, a tag scan to sort of just prove that the patient is not bleeding, so that we don't have to you know, do anything for, uh, to them. Um, 
but the performance characteristics are kind of all over the map just to sort of um, uh, sum it up. So we don't, I don't think we use it all that much. I don't know how often you guys order them, but I, I rarely order them just to, again, to sort of to prove that someone is not bleeding. Um, in terms of angiography and transarterial embolization, so of course you're, you're able to provide direct therapy. Um, you can actually use provocative maneuvers. We've had patients where they've had recurrent bleeds and we just can't find the source. So the IR would actually, is actually willing to take them to angio and give them like heparin or something like that and then see if something bleeds. Um, you can help localize the lesion for surgical intervention. They can put coils and clips and stuff. Um, and, um, but of course the limitations include um, the fact that you really need a brisk bleed for them to catch something on angiography. Um, there are um, complications that can occur, so dye-related complications, thromboembolic events. Uh, I have seen cases of bowel infarction when they go a little bit too uh, aggressive with their embolization, um, and cat catheter site uh, issues. Um, the diagnostic yield is actually um, kind of variable, and again, this really uh, speaks to the fact that you really need a good amount of blood flow, uh, or blood loss, to get a positive uh, study. And again, highest yield is in really um, massive bleeders or with a positive CTA. Um, so this was a, a retrospective study that I found interesting. So many consecutive patients with a brisk GI bleed who underwent angiography and embolization, um, they had a technical success rate of 98% and a primary clinical success rate of 71%, sec secondary clinical success rate of 78%, and bowel infarction occurred in three patients, 4%, which is not insignificant considering the, the outcome, the, the sort of the negative uh, uh, outcomes after bowel infarctions. Um, and uh, the interesting thing here, here to take away was that the predictors of, a, of failure to achieve third-day hemostasis where someone is really, really anemic, they had a big bleed, so they're less likely to get a good outcome if they're coagulopathic. Upper GI bleeds don't respond as well to uh, embolization. And uh, if they had more than one uh, embolized vessel, suggesting there's maybe a multifocal source of bleeding. All right, and um, so let's say our um, angiogram is negative in this patient, then uh, we either can go back to our enteroscopy or to surgery. Um, enteroscopy in massive bleeding has, does have a role. Um, this is a study of um, uh, where emergent enteroscopy was performed in 27 patients um, with um, small bowel bleeding, and they found um, a number of lesions in, in these patients, mostly vascular lesions. 23 lesions were amenable to endoscopic therapy, and 21 out of 23 uh, were successfully treated. Um, and uh, so basically, these authors concluded that emergent endoscopy is, an, is another option. If you don't want to take the patient for angiogram, if they're not a, a, a candidate for angiogram for whatever reason, if they have um, kidney disease or, or what have you. Um, However, you may need more than one procedure. Some of these patients needed as, as many as four enteroscopies to treat their bleeding. And the rebleeding rates, as I said before, are relatively high, especially in these vascular patients. Uh, about a third have uh, rebleeding <coughs> down the line. Um, all right, so all else fails, we go to surgery. So in surgery, what we'll, what we'll do is um, there's a couple of approaches we can use. Either we go down um, from above, and then the surgeon kind of Capture, catches our scope and drags it, or we go from below and they catch our scope and drag it, or as you see in this, in this picture, um, they make an enterotomy. They sort of extravasate the bowel, um, make an enterotomy, and then we put our scope in. Um, and that way you can run the entire small bowel because you have the surgeon's help. So, um, so indications for this are small bowel lesions that can't be localized through, non, through less invasive means, I should say. Uh, detection of a small bowel lesion that can be managed through angiography or endoscopy. Advantages are, of course, that you can reliably uh, achieve complete small bowel evaluation, has a high diagnostic yield, and a relatively high um, long-term um, success rate. The disadvantages, of course, this is really, really uh, invasive. Um, you may cause uh, small bowel damage. There, these people get a really prolonged ileus because we're mucking around with the small bowel for a long, long period of time. Um, and the recurrence rate is still relatively high and the mortality is relatively high. So um, I think, you know, in my illustrious four-year career, I've probably sent maybe two or three people for an intra-op scope for bleeding that we just couldn't localize. And I think um, all of them were negative. We just still couldn't find it. 
Um, so really, really frustrating problem. Um, all right. So I think that's all I got. So a couple of uh, parting words. So, um, so proper characterization of a patient's presentation is essential in determining the appropriate diagnostic and therapeutic algorithm. So is the patient uh, having overt bleeding, occult bleeding, how brisk is the bleeding? That'll sort of guide what study uh, you do. Um, capsule endoscopy is, in general, the initial in the evaluation of suspected small bowel bleeding. Uh, Device-assisted enteroscopy, or double balloon and single balloon enteroscopy, play a role in the diagnosis uh, and management of both occult and overt small bowel bleeding. And the efficacy is highest when it's guided by a positive capsule first. Uh, and the management of small bowel bleeding is an imperfect science, and all guidelines must be applied sound clinical judgment and keep your fingers crossed. Um, and I thank you for the invitation. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I left it out because I, I didn't think I would have time to get through all this. Um, so I've had a couple of patients who've done really well with it. Um, so basically, um, you start them on 50 mic uh, micrograms sub-Q three times a day. Um, and uh, you can transition to the depot form down the line. Um, I've had not a ton, ton of experience with it, but I have used it. Um, the, the studies do show that it does keep people out of the hospital, and it does decrease transfusion requirements. So it's not a, it's not a perfect fix, but it's a, it's a Band-Aid. And for some of these patients who have recurrent small bowel bleeding, you know, recurrent uh, hospitalizations, recurrent um, Transfusions are a big problem, so if you can keep them out for longer with this drug, then it's certainly certainly worth it. The other drugs that are used sometimes are um, uh, steroids, so um, danosol and estrogens, uh, but those don't have very strong evidence to back them up, uh, and thalidomide, um, which I've, I've been too scared to ever prescribe, um, but it does. there is some literature to support thalidomide as an as a effective drug for this. How often do you end up chalking it up to an anticoagulant or being on dual antiplatelets and sort of see how they do, like, if you de-escalate those? Yeah, so um, most, unfortunately, most of these people can't yeah. de-escalate them. Um, so, you know, the way I think about it is if someone has a bleed, there must be a lesion there that's bleeding. And certainly the anticoagulant is precipitating it, but there's got to be something there. So if we can identify it and treat it, then they can safely resume their those drugs that they hopefully are appropriately on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, some of these people, if they have a lesion that it may not bleed if they're not on, you know, plavig, aspirin, effiant, Seralto, all together. Right. Yeah. Yeah, one of your patients with CAD and AFib was on warfarin and aspirin, and if there's no stent, uh, warfarin's pretty good for both. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that, that does come, so once in a while, you can like figure out what, you know, make, like, which one can come off on two or three. Yeah. Uh, but it's tricky. Yeah. I think uh, in, in those cases, you know, I always, I'm always afraid to stop these drugs because I'm more afraid of clots than the bleeds. Mm -hmm. So um, I always sort of talk to the, you know, whoever was the person who decided they need to be on it. I sort of punt the decision to them, whether that's the right decision, the thing to do or not. But So I don't th I've never done uh, an emergent middle of the night enteroscopy, and probably the reason is that the in there's just so much equipment. It's not just like a, you know the regular scope cart that you guys see us wheeling around. Um, there's so much other equipment that and we need some of our techs and nurses to help us that um, it's just kind of not uh, I, don't, I don't think it's logistically doable. Um, but you know I think, in the study that I that I showed, they defined urgent as under 72 hours. So we do have some wiggle room. And in, um, actually, the guidelines for endoscopy define an ur urgent or emergent endoscopy as within 12 to 24 hours. So yeah, we you know we have a little bit of wiggle room to to set up a, sort of a daylight hours procedure, unless someone is actually like really uh, having a huge variceal bleed or something. All right. Thank you.